Hawaii, the state of clean energy with Josh Powell, the CEO of uh, Revolution, a very important uh, solar installer company in Hawaii. Thank you for joining us, Josh. My pleasure. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for the invite. Well, we were originally going to talk about uh, shared solar, which is a, sort of an extension of community solar, as uh, Hawaiian Electric described it last week on our show on energy. Um, but you know what? What's more timely these days is grid services. So let's today talk about grid services, and, and we can talk about shared solar and community server uh, solar later on uh, when we see more happening, because right now, not a lot is yet happening, sorry to say. Um, so let's talk about grid services. And Josh, the first thing I want to ask you is, what is it? So um, we've, we've talked about this a couple of times on Think Tech, um, but, but in short, grid services are, you know, any concept where, and, and here we're, we're talking about, um, you know, what's also been called virtual power plants and um, distributed generation. So we're talking about distributed uh, grid services where, you know, people's solar systems and battery systems on homes and businesses can contribute to the grid by helping to solve grid-based problems like frequency regulation, all the sorts of things that a utility has to do to make sure that the grid stays up and that everybody gets the energy they want. Turns out you can use the, the prolific systems that we have in Hawaii that generate energy at, at the site um, to engage in the grid and help solve grid-based problems. And Hawaii's literally at the forefront nationally, even globally of developing these types of systems and integrating them with the grid at scale to solve problems. Sounds very high tech. It also sounds like something that is changing while we watch, you know? I mean, if we talked about this a year ago, it's probably way different now, simply because of the technology. And the technology is not just uh, the inverters at the, at the homeowner end, uh, but the technology is all the software that lies between the homeowner and um, you know, the utility. I mean, earlier we had this hub and spoke kind of a conceptual approach where it was all generated in the hub and, and shut out to the, the consumer by the spokes. Um, but it's not like that anymore. And it's gotten much more sophisticated. And actually, you know, I agree with you that we are way ahead. Hawaii has been thinking about this for 10 years, at least, maybe more. Um, and I'm really interested in the latest and greatest on, on the grid services and the equipment and the software that's coming into play. And you, Revolution, uh, would be very interested in that and you would be actually marketing it. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, um, you know, again, I'll do a kind of a quick uh, primer on sort of what's been happening. We've been talking about this for, you know, at least a couple of years on ThinkTech, but um, last summer, Two, two programs were kicked off by um, the PUC and by HECO. Um, you know, one is a RFP, you know, a, a RFP-based pro program that uh, HECO released that had been out in the public domain for a couple of years. And there've been programs before that, um, but, but that one is with a mainland company called Swell Energy and it's called Home Battery Rewards. The other program. Tell everybody what RFP means so that everybody. Oh, a request for proposal. So when the utility wants to hire somebody to solve a problem, you know, usually these are pretty big uh, things. Uh, you know, they'll 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 put out a proposal and request. And so there was a long proposal process that we participated in with this company, Swell Energy, and with Tesla. Um, we were the three participants in that, and that was awarded to them early last year. And then the program started to go live and recruit customers about mid-summer. And we're just now getting to full implementation of that program. So we've been recruiting. We're in the very final testing stages. We have actually the first maybe dozen or so customers that are in the program now utilizing services and it'll start to scale up over the next couple of months. We have another program that the PUC put forward called battery bonus um, that um, is basically you bring any any battery that meets the criteria it's pretty simple it's a discharge every day for 10 years from the battery um, and you get some rewards based on you know how much energy you can discharge and what the does uh, discharge mean 
Does that mean you send it back to the yeah, utility? Yeah, send back to the grid, exactly. Right. So imagine your solar puts energy in a battery during the day, and then this happens to discharge from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, when you know when it's queued to discharge, then it would it would send energy back either at full power or at you know whatever you can actually set it so it doesn't have to be full power. Um, but you would send that energy back from the battery into the grid. And the idea of this program is to offset the Kaliloa coal plant, the AES plant that's being shut down uh, later this year, and to basically replace the energy that that plant would deliver to the grid as firm power in the afternoon, evening, when people are coming home and starting to use everything after work. And, you know, that the PUC has been concerned for a number of years about how we're going to displace that once we shut it down. The state has a mandated shutdown, I think, in September of this year. And the, the that grid services program battery bonus is meant to do that. And, and what happens is if a customer signs up for that program, they're kind of there's two things they get to do. They can expand on an existing net metered uh, solar system. So if you bought a solar system, say, you know, five or 10 years ago, and which, you know, you haven't been able to expand those systems typically on metering, they allow you now to expand the system under net metering. So essentially increase your original net metering contract. And then if you, you have to add a battery to, you know, to be able to participate in a program like this, you get a cash reward essentially for the amount of kw that the battery can discharge and that's been very um, attractive i think probably every company on oahu every solar company on oahu is recruiting people to do that and you know adding on to these systems so let's talk about that for a minute the cash bonus that you get back because you're you know sending discharging back to the utility so to speak um, that comes from what utility? Yeah, I mean, ba basically, right. I mean, it, it's it's uh, the PUC who regulates our utility. You know, can tell them how to spend money and how not to spend money. And so, for the battery bonus program, I believe it was about thirty thirty five million that was uh, is set aside in their budget to address this. But if you think about it, um, that money. You know, one way or the other, Hawaiian Electric has to pay for these kinds of services, right? They they either develop it themselves or they hire a contractor like AES to do it with a power plant. So in this case, what they're doing is they're shifting some of that money that would normally go to, uh, you know, a, a, say a commercial or industrial provider of energy services to the utility, and they're sending it back to consumers you know, and think of it almost like they're renting your battery. You know, they're 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 leasing or or paying you to allow your battery to be used on the grid. You're you're in turn signing a ten year commitment to to do that every day. And then there's software on board the equipment. So we you know we call it a grid code in the industry, but basically the the battery is configured in a way that it'll do what it's supposed to do. And you have to. You know, once you've installed it, it has to go through some tests and things like that to validate that. So they know that the resource is going to do what what it's supposed to do. So, Joshua, you know what what strikes me is that they, we still have this issue in the legislature um, about um, credit tax credits for um, what adding on um, storage facilities, storage equipment on an existing system. So if I have an existing system, maybe I can get this uh, bonus battery program, but there is still an issue about whether I can get the tax credit. What's the yeah. status of that? How does that? How does that? So how the does way, that interact? Yeah, the way we see it is as long as you're, you know, as long as it's a system and you're adding PV, the battery is necessary to that system and that meets the required the requirements of DOE tax. I'm say that not as a tax advisor, but I can say we have done some inquiries with DOE tax and that meets their uh, meets their regulatory requirements. But what you're talking about is specifically the legislature making it okay to install a battery and get benefits 
um, with or without additional PV. So in, in most cases with these systems, batteries are being added with additional PV panels, so additional production. And, and that's kind of the idea, right? You want the energy going into these batteries that's gonna be discharged to the grid later to be coming from solar. Um, you know, and that's, that's so if, if, if presuming the existing solar on the house, you know, in the case of like an existing net metered system where you're going to add on a couple new batteries and some PV, you know, typically it's a pretty safe assumption that that existing PV is, you know, maybe covering, you know, some, you know, 80, 90% of the existing home consumption, maybe less. Usually over time, we find that people use more energy. So they're typically going to need more more panels anyway, um, but then coupled together, you know that typically there's not an issue getting the tax credit in that circumstance. So, but it would still be great for the legislature to make it simple for batteries, and I think the this really calls that out. I mean, the battery is you know when you when you couple distributed batteries with a bunch of distributed energy production it makes for an incredibly resilient grid um, because as we started with your original analogy, hub and spoke, now you've got energy being produced and stored all along those spokes all over the place and, and sort of effectively connecting things in a much more robust way such that you know, even pockets, you know, limit, you know, individual circuits could potentially, you know, be stronger in terms of resisting something that might shut them down, a, a voltage drop or uh, a line going down, something like that. It's a lot easier to isolate. And then, of course, each home that has a system like that is individually able to disconnect and stay up, stay on, you know, stay, have power continuously um, in the event of some kind of outage. You know, do you know why the legislature is reluctant to um, expand the tax credit for existing solar facilities? It seems to me there's no good reason. And yet uh, that bill has been in uh, the hopper for five years running now. And for some reason, it can't get through. Is there a policy objection to it? You know, I think the uh, you know, I'm not I'm not the policy wonk that I probably should be for for our, <laughs> our local, uh, uh, you know, what the legislature is doing in, on these particular things. But um, I think, you know, in, if I recall in the past, some of that has been, you know, there was a reciprocal erosion of the, the tax credit itself, which is a good credit. Um, I think when you you think about the latest from the IPCC and you think about where we are in Hawaii and the needs of our community, um, you know, we should really be doing everything we can. And I mean, Hawaii, you know, is in a profoundly good position to, in this decade, really become completely independent in terms of energy. And, um, and I, I just think, you know, the amount of revenue that leaves the state to buy oil, to burn, for energy, it's, you know, there's no, there, there's no technological reason that we can't with, you know, with things like this, with grid services um, and other technologies, there's just no, you know, we should, we should be pioneering non-carbon-based jet fuel in Hawaii. You know, we should be making that right here and helping airlines to, to you know, that, to, to do that kind of thing. And, and we truly can get to a, a place where we're just not bringing hydrocarbons to Hawaii. Um, yeah, well, <clears throat> you mentioned earlier the, um, you know, the, the, the termination of coal um, under that statute uh, adopted a couple of years ago that allows um, coal only until September 1, uh, 2022, yep. which is what, only three or four months away, gee whiz. Yep. And, and the question that the PUC has been concerned about and very explicitly is uh, what are we going to do when we have to shut the coal plant down for that statute. Um, and I, I, what I hear you saying, and I'd, I'd like more detail if you can give it to me, is that the solution to that problem, replacing the coal, which actually accounts for a lot, a lot of electrical power in the state, yep. um, is through solar. But can we do that? If we really work hard and we do 
as you said, everything we can possibly do, can we uh, replace the, you know, uh, the gap left at the end of coal? I, I, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I feel like um, I don't, you know, I don't even have to hesitate. Um, the customer, dem customer demand is there. Um, I think the incentives that have come along with these programs are strong enough. They've accelerated the market. Um, it's not a demand issue. I mean, honestly, like in, in Honolulu, the issue, the biggest issue we have, and I, I, I always hate, you know, it's never the thing in Hawaii to call something out, but the biggest impediment is actually uh, entitlement in terms of like getting approvals. And um, and I'd say that's at every level. Um, there are challenges with residential permits. Um, you know, if I go back five or six years ago, the automated PV permit system that we had, almost 100% of residential rooftop PV permits could be issued online um, with little delay. Now, I'd say we're probably around 60% of permits submitted are issued automatically and the rest drop into you know, multi-month reviews for, for, you know, a range of things, not unreasonable things, but, uh, you know, frankly, most of the, them are things that could be easily solved. And, you know, we, for instance, in Hawaii still look at batteries. Uh, we, they re require a very specific separate permitting process uh, called a materials and methods permit that takes several months to get for any new battery. Once you've got it, then you can go through the automated process. But, you know, for batteries that have now been deployed in Hawaii for several years, UL listed, you know, NEC compliant, these are the codes that are relevant. Um, you know, no major incidents in residential homes resulting from batteries. I think, um, you know, we're, we're kind of past the point where we need to treat it like it's something unusual that needs to be scrutinized. Um, and we I can think, do better than we can do better than we're doing in terms and, and, of and, 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 and I, applications. Yeah, and I'll say, you know, the the administration, the mayor's administration, administration is is also looking at these issues among other things. I mean, they're trying to run a government, um, but there's a lot we could do to improve the process and make it faster. And um, yeah, I you know I think we need a little more urgency statewide on on that um as we do you know globally yeah uh, we all want to touch that too but um on the question of um bad weather let's say let's say extreme weather because it's out there it's out there and it's pointed at us at some point you know climate change is going to direct mm -hmm. some bad weather our way and and we'll have some kind of you know catastrophe that will affect our our grid and so, you know, I'm, I'm wondering two things about this. Um, so solar is a big solution and it, it clearly has emerged as, as the best solution for all kinds of reasons. Uh, some of them scientific and some of them are societal, if you will, or political. Um, but um, if we had bad weather and we have uh, the people who can afford uh, solar and batteries um, they will be they will be in a better you know position a better condition would they not in terms of recovering from the bad weather on the other hand I'm thinking to myself you know in the case of the internet switches around the world uh, in case of the cables under sea if a piece of cable goes down or a piece of internet connection connectivity goes down um, the software is smart enough to reroute the signal and that's why uh, even you know bad weather or trouble at sea or at the ocean bottom doesn't stop us um, because we can reroute. We do reroute. Now, when when you're talking about grid services and talk about um, you know batteries and new storage techniques and and also software, are we also talking about rerouting? In other words, if the utility cannot um, pump energy out to me and I'm a non-solar customer. Um, does this new grid services technology help the utility dealing with, um, you know, uh, uh, blackout possibilities, uh, bad weather, what have you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, 
yeah, you know, I'm also uh, an architect. I'm, and, uh, um, you know, to me, buildings, you know, need to be resilient and holistic from an energy point of view. Like, it doesn't make sense to me to build a building at this point in time without energy technology embedded in it, including, you know, harvesting energy and, and storing energy on site. And that creates a basic level of resilience that, you know, we haven't had in buildings for a while, but it's not like historically, uh, you know, we, we've been in a period of time for the last 100, 125 years where we've, you know, moved the source of energy away from the building. You know, prior to that, you know, you, you're heating for a building, you're cooling for a building, you know, water, things like that were, were typically, you know, essentially centered on the building and, um, it, you know, physical plants were pretty common, you know, if you go back a hundred years in energy and, um, you know, we're, we're moving because of this technology, we're in a, in a, in a place now where that can easily be integrated in, in the building as it evolves. But then, you know, when you connect this in a network, just like we, you know, the, the internet is a great, you know, great analogy for, for grid services, all these things can now move those move that energy around. And so somebody that doesn't have enough, they can they can borrow a little or buy a little and, and vice versa. And when it's integrated at the utility level within the utilities, you know, operations system, um, you've got software that can help to manage that in real time. And, you know, frankly, it can move the electrons faster than somebody could even start a generator, um, especially when they're stored in, in batteries and, and you have a robust supply. And, you know, what's happened on Oahu and, and broadly in Hawaii over the last four or five years is we've been deploying a lot of distributed batteries in homes because it's, you know, it just works out that it's cheaper for people to cycle their own battery with electrons day to night than to buy energy from the utilities. And the price is high enough that people save a lot of money that way. So even, even in economically challenged areas, I mean, we need financing programs that get, get access for people that are, you know, coming from a, you know, lower income strata, maybe they can't use the tax credits, things like that. And we do have some programs. We have, uh, you know, state-based programs, GEMS, you know, we have a number of things in Hawaii that help with that too. Um, but when you connect it all, you have this very robust system that, you know, both can be functional when it's disconnected. And I mean, I'd say in that sense, it's almost better than the internet, right? I mean, if we lose our connectivity, all of our apps are kind of useless. Not the case in your home. I mean, if, if the grid goes down, you still have an energy system that's going to work as long as you've got a roof. Um, and, you know, we can get well, that, into that. That takes me to another question I want to pose <laughs> to you. And that is, um, you know, you mentioned earlier, and it's of great concern that right now we're in a global crisis uh, over Ukraine and yeah. Mr. Putin and Western Europe and, and so forth. And uh, you don't have to read the Times uh, every day to know how how troubled we are and how disturbed our global oil markets are. Um, and, and that is going to get worse, in my opinion. Uh, I think it's clear that it will. And so, you know, this whole issue that you and I are talking about, the whole thing about solar on your roof, uh, about grid services, about the, um, you know, the, the, the new technologies that connect you and enable the utility to share the energy uh, that is uh, returned to you, um, more important all the time. You know, if we worried about importing billions of dollars of oil a few years ago, we should be much more worried about it now, not only in price, but in availability in general. You know, the, the world market is turning really sour. Um, and so, well, I think, go ahead. You know, I think the, the, the most sort of uh, a visceral example of this for for somebody living here in Honolulu right now is if you have a solar system already and you have enough energy to support an electric vehicle, which you know let's say you already have two, we have a high concentration of EVs. 
you know, people in that situation are not getting impacted by increasing electricity rates, which we have, you know, we've already seen significant increases this year because of oil spikes. And we've seen huge increases at the pump. And so again, if you're if you have a big enough system that you're supporting your transportation needs as well, you're also isolated from that. So while there's plenty of other inflationary pressures on the economy, you know, people that that frankly own their own energy system or are in an apartment building that happens to have one or something like that, they're much better isolated from that um, than than anyone else. And so I look at it as just practical. It's like it's something you can do. You certainly, you know, I hope people are driven by the sort of noble ideal of let's do it to, you know, help help uh, abate climate change and save the planet and things like that. But um, but you can do it very pragmatically just from an economic point of view. And there's, you know, it's very easy typically to finance these systems. Um, you know, it doesn't, it's not like a big, you know, you don't have to come up with the cash up front. And there's some really good incentives that aren't even tax-based, right? There's incentives just to participate in these grid services programs. And that's real. I, the one thing that I think is also you know, we talked about the economics and I want to make sure I make this point, you know, that money that was set aside by the PUC to support the battery bonus program, estimates are that it's somewhere between one fifth to one third of what the utility would have to pay for those services if they were doing it in a traditional way. And that's, that's not just Hawaii, that's actually pretty, pretty much what, what we see nationally is that grid services programs will save utilities somewhere between one fifth and one tenth of what they currently pay for gas peakers and the, the types of technology that typically do these kinds of functions. It means your electric bill would be less in any event. Ultimately, I think as we build out a ubiquitous renewable energy system, we'll see that, that costs come down across the board. Um, you know, it, it takes a lot to build that out, but I think that's what will ultimately happen. Um, we'll end up having a lot more energy resource, honestly. Yeah. And, you know, that, well, we've and, learned, we've learned a bunch of stuff from you here today. One is we've learned that there's new technology in town, um, yeah. that is available that can be installed, that can be integrated with older technology. That is something, uh, we've learned that, um, it's, it's a more resilient system when you can put grid services in and help the utility share the share the power, so to speak, between all its customers. Uh, we've learned that uh, there are at least a couple of really good reasons um, to A, uh, to, to, to go to solar. And for that matter, there are a couple of really good reasons to worry about not going to solar. <laughs> it's a carrot and a stick both. Um, yep. And, and then, of course, I think we've learned, although we haven't discussed this specifically, but I think we've learned that we have to do this quickly. And, and this is the bottom line, we have to do more of it. We have to do um, the term you mentioned earlier, everything we can uh, here in Hawaii, because we're an island state far away from the mainland and the national grids. So my question to you is this, what do we do now, both in terms of the state government, uh, the, the call it the energy industry, the solar industry, and the individual consumers to achieve the notion of doing everything we can possibly do. Let's say is, you know, today is the first day in the rest of our energy lives, and we have to put the left foot out first. What do we do? I think it's actually really simple. If you have a home or a business in Hawaii, I mean, this sounds a little self-serving because this is what we do, but if, you, if you're in that situation uh, and you control a rooftop, you should make sure that you've got solar on that roof and, uh, you know, batteries, you know, frankly, should be coupled with it to make it truly resilient. I think there's just, you know, for the resilience to, to avoid storms and the repercussions of, of climate change, um, but also to help abate it and frankly, to save money. Um, it's, it's a really obvious thing to do. Um, and there's, there are ways to do it, um, at almost any level, you know, economics, whatever, um, none of those things should really be an impediment. Um, there's a bunch of other things around the edges, 
you know, improving the planning process and, and making it easier to, uh, to do, do things. But I don't think those are, you know, at the end of the day, everybody just needs to get it done. Yeah, I don't think that's self-serving at all. You know, in my view, uh, think tech has been advancing this notion for 10 years plus. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it becomes more and more clear that we have to do this. And sometimes I think we, we forget we have to do this. It's a sine curve of public interest. You know, sometimes people are more ardent about it and sometimes they're not. <clears throat> but our current situation here and globally mandates that we get on it and that we do everything we can. And uh, I'm with you all the way. And I don't think it's self-interest. I think it's, it's public policy. And I think it's absolutely necessary for the, uh, the success of the state. And Hawaii's out in front. It's honestly, it's very exciting to be here, to be able to be part of what's happening. Um, you know, we're, we're leading this um, very genuinely. We're leading this nationally. We have the most sophisticated grid services programs anywhere right now. And that's pretty exciting. What's your uh, website address, Josh? Uh, www.revolutsun.com. Wow. Pretty easy. <laughs> One of the oldest, wisest, um, most successful uh, solar companies in the state. And you do more. That's the subject of another show, <laughs> perhaps about community or shared solar or who knows what going forward. Thank you so much, Absolutely. Josh Powell, uh, CEO of Revolut Sun. Thanks, Jay. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.